Hey, well, here's a video I never thought I'd be making and never wanted to be making, because this is a channel which talks about video games. I don't talk about serious stuff a lot of the time. But, you know, after coming back from a long break, I put up my first Phoenix Point video together, but it just felt disingenuous and, and wrong, given the enormity of the world events that are going on at the time. Because over the last week or so, the world has been treated to quite an incredible sight. Um, a conventional military conflict in Europe in which uh, the forces of the Russian Federation, long vaunted by NATO as potential peer adversaries, appear to have really, really bloody struggled uh, against the Ukrainian armed forces. And this has come as a surprise to a greater or lesser extent to most commentators. Now, I don't want to join the barrage of armchair generals that are uh, giving their quick takes on this at the time, but I thought I'd use it as an opportunity to discuss the concept, um, a concept which I am familiar with, which is the idea of investing in a capability ahead of time in order to meet a national objective. Um, we've talked about operational concepts in relation to video game before. Today, I'm going to talk about a real concept in relation to a real event, and that is why, in my view, the Russian military was simply not built for this conflict, and that explains at least part of the... Uh, well, the interesting results that we have been seeing to date. Um, the reason I'm making this is because in the lead up to the conflict, and even since the conflict broke out, I have been seeing graphics like this everywhere. Um, news organizations, hot takes, articles trying to paint this as a massive underdog story. Russia is the traditional big bad, and we've been seeing numbers everywhere, like the Ukrainians are outnumbered 5 to 1, 10 to 1, that they are being outspent 10 to 1. Um, and even now, even with everything that's happened in terms of the, the intense resistance that the Ukrainian, both regular military and the territorial defense forces have been able to provide, we're still talking about this in the sense that uh, we believe the Ukrainians are still completely and utterly overmatched. The, the roots, I think, of this conception of Russia as the steamroller, the bear, the force that was, when it was the Soviet Union, come steaming through the folder gap and make it to the Rhine in seven days, um, the roots of that conceit go back years. But for those of us in the acquisition space, or for those of us who have been dealing with the, the concept of military acquisitions and investments in the past, um, Russian underperformance doesn't come as that much of a surprise in that narrow sense. Um, so let me answer the question that you're all asking after a minute and a half. What's a gaming guy talking about here? Um, I'm going to cover a few things in this, in this video, in this hot take. I'm going to explain what I'm not trying to do. Then I'm going to talk about the fact that military strategy is built strategy. You can't just make it up as you go along unless you're willing to sacrifice a real um, premium in blood and treasure in order to accomplish your goals. You need to plan for capabilities that you're going to require later and invest in them in advance. Then we're going to look at the Russian military defense budget. We're going to ask where did all the rubles go if not into developing the kind of capabilities that would cause them to not get embarrassed by a whole bunch of militia with uh, 1980s ATGM tech. Um, we're going to talk about the Ukrainian military, by contrast, uh, what's happened since 2014 from an investment standpoint, what capabilities that generated. We're going to talk about the current situation that's resulting. I'm going to try and answer the conceit then, uh, which is, does this mean the Russian army is shit? Is it a complete paper tiger? Or was it just built for a different type of conflict? And then in my view, having examined those concepts, what could the Russians have done better from an investment perspective? What can the West do now? And also, what are the lessons for us uh, in our respective countries or our own organizations? You don't have to be in the military to take this conception on board. Um, the idea of making sure that you are investing not in vanity capabilities, but what your um, government, what your state requires in order to accomplish its underlying goals. And that's an area where I've got a little bit more familiarity. So there we are. So what this presentation isn't, this is my disclaimer, because I, like I said, I'm getting really frustrated with the number of uneducated hot takes out there, uh, and I count mine among them. Uh, I'm not military, and the internet doesn't need more experts commenting outside their field. So I'm not going to be passing judgment on Russia's apparently operational and tactical batshit decisions. They appear batshit to me, but we're talking about the fog of war. We've got propaganda coming out from both sides. It's hard to get clarity. I don't have access to any classified intel any more than 99% of the people listening to this channel do. Um, so I can't answer why they're making these terrible decisions. I can't tell you why they keep dropping the VDV uh, in suicidally small groups well ahead of ground and air support. I can't tell you for sure who's going to win. I don't want to answer operational tactical questions. I'm going to try and keep the Ukraine strong memes to a, to a minimum, but, you know, 
gaming channel it runs in the blood out of respect for the immense humanitarian tragedy that is playing out in eastern europe at the moment i'm going to try and keep that tone down but the fact is that the farcical nature of some of the things that have happened during this evasion do indeed merit memes i'll try and stick to my lane in short so let's get to the concept and what i'm trying to debunk here um, people have been trying to paint this and to an extent it is but paint this as a completely two-dimensional David versus Goliath struggle. Uh, Russia, in the, the popular conception, is the inheritor of the USSR's military, and that terrified entire generations of Western observers. Then 1991 happens, the Soviet system collapses, um, and with that, you get the rusted submarines, the um, complete decline in former Soviet military power, and then you have the Putin era in which the military in Russia appears to get uh, constant budget increases, modernization, they get new equipment, they're very good at publicizing that new equipment. They appear to have regained some of that old strength and it has again terrified many Western observers. That coupled with the fact that by hardware count the Russian military is truly gigantic. It may not in spending terms be much larger than a lot of the Western European militaries, but in the sheer number of tanks, armored personnel carriers, uh, all of its kinetic uh, kinetic elements, so fires, um, in attack helicopters, in aircraft, the sheer number of platforms available to the Russian military is, is bonkers. And it's in that respect, in sort of a platform count respect, that it presents itself as a peer to, say, the United States or China. Um, in a lot of commentary, it's placed alongside China as a peer or near peer adversary. And then by comparison, Admittedly, Ukraine in 2014 had a military that basically just fell over. Like there was no resistance um, really uh, to the covert, the, well, the overt covert operations that the Russian Federation launched. So that being so, if the Russians are a modernized inheritor of the old USSR and Ukraine's army was basically MIA in 2014, WTF is going on. Like, why have we got pictures of relatively modern, in some cases, Russian and former Soviet armor looking like they're competing in the, uh, the turret launch Olympics uh, as tank turrets basically try and imitate launches from Kerbal Space Program all over Ukraine? Why do we have images of Ukrainian farmers um, dragging away stranded Russian military vehicles and trucks? Uh, why do we have videos of babushkas torching um, Pansir uh, SAM systems with Molotov cocktails after they're abandoned by their crew. What is going on? Because this can't possibly be what Moscow has planned. There are answers that people can give you from a tactical perspective, from an operational perspective, from a morale perspective. And the reality is that uh, a Western observer in Australia is not the one who's most qualified to give you those observations on why from a tactical and operational perspective, this thing has gone so horribly wrong. I'm even gonna try and stay away from the strategic, but I'm gonna make some controversial statements that I do think I can defend. The first is, in terms of the capabilities that matter in the area that it matters, that is the ability to win a conventional and unconventional military struggle in the territory of Ukraine itself, things are a lot closer between the two sides than they initially appear. My second statement is, if Russia knew this was their goal all along, then they built the wrong kind of military for this conflict. And the third point I'm going to try and defend is, if the West wants to win this, I think they can. And that's just from an industrial, mechanical, technical perspective. And I don't that mean by saying, let's unleash the Poles and send um, NATO storming into Ukraine. I don't mean NATO shooting down Russian jets in a no-fly zone. I simply mean... NATO can provide sufficient material support to the Ukrainian state to enable it to eventually win this conflict, either on the battlefield or in an unconventional conflict following a capitulation. So how am I going to illustrate this? And I'm going to start by talking about the fact that military strategy um, is, I would argue, especially in the modern era, built strategy. So a military is a tool available to a state. It has to be constructed with a specific set of capabilities for certain purposes. Um, militaries are constructed for very, very different things. If, for example, you are a landlocked nation that is only interested in territorial defense, then you do not need a navy. If you're a, a 
force whose enemies are right next door, you do not need strategic long-range aviation capable of intervening everywhere in the world. Whereas if you are the United States and you're protected on both sides by ocean, that you have an interest in maintaining a certain world order, then you need significant expeditionary warfighting capability. It's extremely difficult to build these new capabilities on the fly. It takes years in investment, or you need to pay a premium at the time, and even then there's a limit. Um, if you go to war and you suddenly need a navy, no amount of money in the world will suddenly give you a shipbuilding industry, dockyards, people who know how to crew it, maintain them, and a whole bunch of sailors who know how to operate warships. Um, those things need to be built. Some things can be created quicker than others. A small arms sector and infantry. Most nations can throw that together quickly in a hurry. You can just buy in simple systems and train people on them. But the more complex the platform, the longer the lead time in terms of investment. So tactics might take months. So training people to, say, stage an ambush doesn't take very long. But military industrial capabilities can take decades. If you decide um, that you are a wealthy nation and you tomorrow want to build a fifth generation fighter, for example, a very advanced fighter, um, it's going to take you a bloody long time to develop the industry capable of doing that. One great example of this is the fact that even though the Chinese defense budget is far larger than the Russian defense budget, until recently, most of these modern apparent designs coming out of the People's Liberation Army Air Force still used Russian engines. Because even after all this time, the industrial know-how and experience that was left legacy left over from the Soviet Union in Russia still exceeded the capabilities that were present in mainland China. Um, that is changing over time. That's the point of continuous PLA modernization funding and support for state-owned enterprises in the defense sector, but it can take a very long time. So with that in mind, how does this process work for those of you who, are, who have never worked in this space? Um, this is very... Apologies if this is boring to those of you who are familiar with the space, but let's talk about the obvious. Um, most nations decide years in advance or decades in advance what they think their military requirements are likely to be. What do you want your military to do? What is its goal? What is its objective? What do your adversaries look like? Um, and then you work backwards. Okay, if I need to be able to accomplish X goal, what equipment do I need to do it? Um, if my goal is to defend the sea lanes near my nation so that I can do trade, okay, well, I'm probably going to need submarines, I'm going to need maritime monitoring, I don't need a lot of tanks, for example. Um, and then I work backwards, okay, what investments do I need to make in industry so that I can maintain those things, or what allies do I need to have in order to source those capabilities, uh, what training do I need to do so my forces can maintain them. And then governments have to be quite ruthless about what capabilities they're willing to pay for, which they aren't. Um, it's very easy to run up your tab when you're doing defense spending. There's a lot of very expensive capabilities out there. When individual aircraft can run to hundreds of millions, when you can have seaborne platforms that run into the billions, um, and that's just the original purchase price, you then have to sustain those capabilities. You have to pay crew, you have to maintain the platform, spare parts, maintenance, refurbishment. Um, it means that you have to be pretty ruthless in terms of what you actually choose to maintain. Um, now, you can try and be good at everything, but then you end up with the U.S. defense budget. And even the U.S. defense budget makes concessions and trade-offs. Remember, the U.S. spends significantly more on defense than any other country on the planet. And it's for that reason that it maintains advantages in so many fields of operation. But even then, in the specific areas its adversaries choose to challenge it, they can reach near-peer levels. And they can do it by focusing what they're developing in those specific areas. So the process, and I'm just using um, Australia as an example, you'd have a white paper which sets out you know, goals, objectives, broad scope for the military. You'd have supporting things like the industry policy statement where you understand where you're going to uh, invest in and support the industry. You have acquisition and sustainment plans, doctrine, training, deployment, all follow down from this. Doctrine is informed by your requirements. The training is informed by the doctrine. Um, your physical deployments are informed by the strategic situation you find yourself in, where the likely threats are going to be, where you need to posture. Uh, the whole process is covered in any country on the planet with lobbyists, politics, and in some countries, significant amounts of corruption. And it's no secret that this definitely applies in the Russian context. Um, for example, let's just say that you, there is a specific state within your country which manufactures a particular class of vehicle or a particular aircraft. And logic dictates that you should probably divest it because it costs too much to maintain or it's outdated or it doesn't fit with your overall strategy. 
But the politicians from that state may not want you to discontinue production there. They may in fact push for that system to be maintained so that the jobs can be maintained in that state, for example, which can mean that there are more inputs into what your acquisition strategy are than just what the simple military requirements are. So let's think we're Russia for a moment. What did they need if they were gonna go into this conflict and win? And when I say win, let's go with the assumption as many people are going with that the goal was to shatter Ukrainian communications, decapitate the leadership and achieve victory before Western sanctions and support could bite. Now that is still, in my opinion, a shit plan. I think it's an unrealistic shit plan, but the idea, let's just assume the plan is to go in and within 48 hours, um, you've taken the capital, you've knocked off Zelensky, you've installed a puppet government, and you can just argue that it's a fait accompli. Um, there's no time for Western weapons to arrive. There's no time for Western supports to happen. There might not even be as much momentum for sanctions because what, what's gonna change at that point? You're dug in, you've seized, you've seized the control of the country, you've established a new government. What, what are they gonna do really? So let's assume that's the goal. What do you need? Well, you'd need top tier intelligence command and control because you need to be able to move quickly, control the operation, you need to be adapt on the fly to things that go wrong. Uh, you need amazing suppression of enemy air defense capabilities. You need seed capabilities because you need to own the sky from day one because the only way you're gonna take all your critical objectives on day one is through airborne operations and light forces. And we saw this happen with the Vedeve deploying uh, to Hostomel airport, uh, for example. Um, and we see plenty of evidence that the Russians basically tried to end run a bunch of political targets, like they bypassed centers of resistance and sent small groups of light forces down roads in order to take objectives, hoping that enemy resistance would be light. You, but you, to do that safely, you need to be able to own the sky, and that means being able to suppress enemy air defenses. You also need great close air support capabilities. You probably need a lot of precision guided munitions because if you haven't had time to bring up your other sources of fire, so your, in their case, their heavy tube and rocket artillery, um, and you're trying to limit civilian casualties for political reasons, um, those light forces are gonna need support, and that means lots and lots of CAS sorties being able to strike precision targets. Uh, you then obviously need those elite light forces who are capable of readily calling in fires, coordinating that with their maneuvers in order to seize critical targets, but also overcome conventional military resistance, because it's not like your enemy's capital city, for example, is gonna be undefended. It's not like they weren't aware that the Russian Federation had airborne forces. Um, and then you need sustainment to an operational depth of a few hundred kilometers. Um, Kiev, and apologies, I, uh, I spent years at university studying Eastern Front World War II um, operations. So I'm trying to force myself to use Ukrainian spellings and pronunciations for the relevant cities, but to my brain after all these years, it is still Kiev. Um, you need to be able to sustain your forces far enough from the Belarusian border or whatnot in order to actually seize these critical targets. You need to link up with your airborne operators um, and basically close things out. Preferably, you would also not, as the Russians have been, be using things like civilian unencrypted radios to coordinate some of your movements, which the Ukrainians can listen to. And indeed, random people in Australia with internet radio receivers can listen into if they have a basic knowledge of Russian and occasionally hear call and response from Russian military units, because that was pretty embarrassing. Um, so this is, a, this is a snapshot of the sort of capabilities you might want if you had tried to pull this, off, this operation off with any sort of prospect of immediate success. So where are these capabilities? If Russia is spending 15 times, 10 times as much as Ukraine on defense, where are these capabilities that they needed in order to conduct this operation? Where did the rubles go? So um, these are CIPRI estimates on uh, Russian expenditure in USD constant 2018 terms and less left. Um, Russia's fourth, fifth largest defense spender in the world. It does vary a little bit from year to year. Um, Saudi expenditure, for example, has an effect on where they place in the rankings. Um, Russian military expenditure has significantly increased since 2010, although it has been partly um, offset by the reduction in the power of the ruble. But even though these numbers seem relatively low, especially compared to say American numbers, um, we do have to remember there are some purchasing power advantage, uh, purchasing power parity advantages that Russia and China enjoy. That is, 
because you can buy more for an American dollar in Russia or more for an American dollar in China than you can in America, um, less money goes further. Your labor doesn't cost as much. You don't have to pay your soldiers as much. You don't have to pay your maintenance personnel as much. Um, a lot of your companies will sell equipment a little bit cheaper because their labor costs are lower and whatnot. There's, so you get a little bit more bang for your buck. And it's certainly this expenditure dwarfs Ukraine's expenditure, although we'll talk later about why, why Ukraine's expenditure is a little bit deceptive. So where do these funds go? And the answer, unfortunately, for the Russians in the current conflict is not really overwhelmingly towards the capabilities they needed. Um, I mean, the first thing is the Russian atomic arsenal. Um, Russian legacy nuclear capabilities are horrifying. Um, the strategic rocket forces are so important that they are largely independent of the rest of the military. Imagine if they imagine if the rocket forces had a status equivalent to like the United States Air Force. They're um, impressively separate. Um, the warhead count is is measured in thousands. I think it's something like 6,000 warheads, uh, 1,600 deployed missiles. I'm going off I'm going off memory here. Um, and beyond these sort of legacy arsenal that they've inherited from the Soviet Union and pared down to, mod nuclear modernization has been a significant effort over the last decade. So you've seen either completely new systems or systems that were being developed towards the tail end of the Soviet Union actually being deployed. So Topol M, Sarmat, Bulova, um, so those are two road mobile ICBMs and a submarine launch ballistic missile. And these things are hilariously, hideously uh, expensive. Nuclear programs are very expensive. In particular, nuclear programs with good delivery systems are fantastically expensive. Um, the figures I found from a couple of studies are that, for example, the US during the Cold War probably spent about 5.5 trillion between 1940 and 1994, I think that is. So between the start of the Manhattan Project and the fall of the Soviet Union, they probably spent about $5.5 trillion on nuclear weapons and nuclear weapon delivery systems. Most of that is the delivery systems, the development and deployment of missiles and whatnot, not the warheads themselves. Um, between 2021 and 2030, the US is going to spend $630 billion on its atomic on its atomic weapons. That's uh, Congressional Budget Office figures there. So, you know, 60 odd billion dollars a year. And some of that is because they're refreshing their delivery systems as well. I bring in US numbers because Russia is not exactly transparent about how much it spends on its nuclear weapons modernization program. We only know that they're rolling out platforms and we see evidence that they're rolling out the platforms, not how much they're spending on it. Um, so costs are driven by nuclear delivery systems and that's exactly what Russia has been spending on. So even if they're cutting corners, there is an immense cost to maintaining these nuclear weapons and those costs are not wholly offset by purchasing power parity issues. Um, and for all of that, these things have no influence on the Ukraine conflict, except for in the very narrow sense that because they exist, you're not going to have a conventional, like a full shooting war between NATO and Russia, because no one wants to end the world in World War III. Um, they'll wave the nuclear saber around in order to signal that the NATO should avoid getting too closely involved. But at the end of the day, nuclear weapons have very limited battlefield utility. Certainly, you're not going to use them in a tactical sense in Ukraine because, one, you're not going to want to deploy nuclear weapons against small groups of blokes riding around shooting javelins at your tanks in the middle of the night. That's just not a good idea. And two, the, the, po the politics of it would be impossible. The environmental impacts would be significant. It's political suicide. They're not going to do it. So they've invested a huge amount of money in something that really isn't providing them a battlefield payback. Um, another thing they've invested really heavily in is the Navy. Uh, the Navy was in terrible shape after the fall of the Soviet Union. The submarines were left to rust. It was, it was an absolute nightmare. But they've still kept a large legacy Navy in service. Um, and this is painful for them because Soviet ships, there's a lot that's good to say about Soviet vessels in terms of the fact they tend to pack very heavy armaments relative to Western compatriots. Um, but they're not designed for easy maintenance. They're not particularly reliable. They're a real pain to keep in service. Um, so readiness levels are always a problem. There's also been modernization. So um, this is a lot, particularly the submarine arm, we've seen significant um, numbers of new systems come into play. Uh, these are usually either late Cold War designs that have been modernized and now produced in large numbers or they're entirely new designs. So uh, the 955A Bore, uh, the Yasin M's, um, the Kirov uh, is getting an overhaul, Kuznetsov is getting an overhaul, um, the 
uh, well, a Kirov class ship is getting an overhaul, it's not the Kirov. Um, they've also brought in a range of new standoff weapons. Uh, the one in the top right, that's the Kalibr. It's a sea launched cruise missile. Um, we've seen a lot of them fired in Ukraine. The relevance of the Russian Navy and all this expenditure, however, to the, um, to the crisis is basically that all they've got out of it is an expensive way to launch cruise missiles. The Baltic fleet, the Pacific fleet, the boomers, the hunter killer subs, everything that Russia has been paying for in that respect, that part of the budget gives them no benefit in the Ukrainian conflict. So we can just, if you're imagining um, a bar chart of Russian military expenditure, chop off most of the benefit of atomics, chuck off most of the Navy spending as completely irrelevant, and we're getting closer and closer to what Ukraine's been spending. Not, we're not there yet, but we're chopping away um, because we've been investing capabilities that don't help us right now. Then there's internal security. Uh, Roskvadia is like 300,000 people. Um, Russia has a huge focus on internal troops, internal security, um, the domestic role of the armed forces. Now, why the, while these sort of troops might be useful for like security duties and behind the line duties, um, they're not equipped with the sort of equipment or training that you're gonna want if you're actually sending them in against a conventional military opponent who's still resisting. Um, it's also quite expensive because personnel costs matter, especially when you're talking about a force where you want it to be politically reliable in case you ever need it to put down domestic dissent. Uh, so you can't exactly staff it with underpaid conscripts who hate the regime. Uh, you've got to keep it in, in reasonable nick as a force. So we have seen some National Guard units um, from Roskvadia in Ukraine. There's some evidence that they were intended to deploy to control rear areas. We'll see what their future role is. But either way, these aren't the elements that were gonna win you your quick war. Then there's all the Wunderwaffe, uh, the wonder weapons. Um, Russia's put a huge focus in pushing technical, technological boundaries in high prestige, cutting edge fields. Uh, this is the scary stuff when Western observers look at this stuff and go, wow. Um, so things like fifth generation fighters, the, the Su-57, um, they've got hypersonic missile techs. So the, the Zircon, which I've got in the middle there, uh, modern armor vehicles like the T-14 series, um, all the doomsday weapons they put out there, like you know underwater nuclear drones that are designed to go into harbors and detonate. Um, these are some of the most expensive R&D programs and systems that a nation can develop and deploy. Um, now, there's an advantage to this for Russia because it helps maintain some of the old expertise in the defense sector um, that they inherited from the Soviet Union. So it prevents it becoming completely moribund. Um, some of these systems have export potential, um, but because they're so expensive, um, development times are long and procurement numbers are really, really low. Like. We haven't seen any Su-57s in Ukraine. We haven't seen any T-14s in operational service, let alone in Ukraine. Um, and the 3M-22 hypersonic missiles, like you don't need them against Ukraine. They're not useful. Um, so all this stuff is completely MIA from the conflict and has barely any utility there anyway, but it's where a lot of the money's been going. And the final element that I want to point to that isn't really helping if you are planning this conflict is huge legacy in ground, um, air and ground forces. Um, Russia inherited huge stocks of Soviet era equipment and there's that tradition expectation that they have a very large army. Uh, Russia has a very bloated officer corps. It's not as bad as it once was, uh, but Shoigu has rolled back some of the reforms there. Um, there need to be a lot of postings. There need to be a lot of units. Um, Maintaining thousands and thousands of aircraft and tanks is not free. Those huge platform numbers you see, um, you can't just, they, they don't cost nothing. You can't just leave them to stand still and hope they're okay. And in fact, some of the problems we're seeing in Ukraine suggest that in some cases, the Russians probably have just left the system there with minimal maintenance. And as a result, it's failing when it goes into action. So you've got these thousands of legacy systems that were built for very different conflicts. Um, and they're supported by conscription. And conscription's a bit of a false economy if you're planning a conflict like this. Uh, conscripts usually won't have the skills, the initiative, the drive, the motivation that you need when you're talking about a really high tempo advance in an offensive operation where they might be low on motivation because they don't even know why the operation's taking place. Um, and also for a nation, a uh, conscription system, if you're actually using conscripts in combat, is a bit of a false economy really, um, because yes, you don't have to pay conscripts very much, but while they're conscripted, those 
same individuals aren't say working a civilian job where they do something productive in the economy and pay taxes. Like it's still relatively expensive when you think about it and it gives you pretty ineffective soldiers. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna simp for the Western concept of the all volunteer force, except for in cases of emergency or for those European countries that maintain conscript forces only so that in the case of uh, being attacked by a larger opponent, they can mobilize a large number of personnel. That makes sense because if you're being attacked uh, motivation amongst your conscripts is probably going to be high and defensive operations have a lower technical skill requirement than a rapid offensive operation. So basically Russia has been investing in a whole bunch of stuff like not particularly relevant to the conflict that they have sought to launch here. Um, and that's indefensible considering that as the attacker they got to pick the conflict. The Ukrainian conflict, uh, Ukrainian forces by comparison, um, so forgive the memes, and I know those are N-laws, not javelins, um, but I found the tweet funny, um, have undergone a huge overhaul since 2014. The amount of Western support that's been flowing in has been extensive. And you have to think for a moment that every dollar Ukraine spends on defense is being spent on the defense of Ukraine. There is no Pacific fleet, there's no Baltic fleet, there's no expeditionary force in Syria, there's no luxury capabilities like they don't have long range strategic aviation capable of ranging out to hit the continental United States, they have no nuclear capabilities, uh, there's no navy, there's no Wunderwaffe development, they don't develop their own weapons really, there's some tank upgrade packages and some domestic firearms, that's about it, everything else is imported from the west. Um, they're able to focus just on what they need. And beyond that, there's also hidden elements of the Ukrainian budget, which is all the capabilities they don't pay for at all. Um, most of us are pretty confident right now, and I have no classified information. My job has no relation to that at the moment. Um, but we're pretty confident that they're getting um, satellite intelligence, really good updates as to the intelligence on Russian movements from Western forces, they don't have to pay for those intelligence. They don't have to launch their own surveillance satellites. They don't have to launch AWACS aircraft to hover around the Polish border and read Russian air movements. They don't have to infiltrate their own guys into the FSB and the Russian military. NATO's already done that for them. It just gives them the information. They also have manpower advantages, um, specifically because they're on the defense, right? Um, when you're operating on the defense and you can call up your reserves and you can call up territorial defense and all of that, um, you're able to mobilize a much larger portion of your population than say Russia is for a conflict like this, especially when Russia hypothetically at least has the rule that says you can't use conscripts um, outside of Russian territory. So even though the Russian forces are larger in total, the number of, of troops that Ukraine can deploy in Ukraine itself is not as asymmetric with the Russian numbers as you would initially think. So They've modernized significantly since 2014. They've known what they're preparing for. The Ukrainian government has decided, I need the capacity to fend off a Russian invasion and all that they have spent on is the capacity to fend off a Russian invasion. So what is happening? Um, and I'm gonna take a pause here to say, we need to remember this is a humanitarian disaster. Um, every life that is lost in this is horrific. A lot of my family are in Eastern Europe, the refugees from Ukraine are flowing in and they're doing everything they can to support. Um, for anyone with a concept of history, um, a love for Slavic culture and appreciation for Russian and Ukrainian history, to see the same mistakes again being made, um, to see a completely unnecessary uh, invasion motivated um, by the worst possible reasons bringing this like let's remember that what we are seeing first and foremost is a humanitarian disaster but from a military perspective we're seeing a lot of problems with the Russian operation so far we're seeing logistical issues material losses we're seeing poor coordination and communication to the point where Russian troops are using civilian radios and cell phones in order to try and coordinate movements we're seeing mud cause problems, we're seeing poor maintenance cause problems, we're seeing memes of abandoned Russian vehicles being stolen by Ukrainian farmers with their tractors. None of the early campaign objectives have likely been achieved and all of the NATO observers who thought of Russia as a peer adversary who are predicting a 72 hour victory see their opponent making gains in Ukraine, sure, but certainly struggling to do so against what was nominally meant to be quite a weak opponent. What I see from my perspective is that a military specifically built for this conflict, 
uh, a Ukrainian force which is constructed with the goal of defending the territory of Ukraine is punching well above its weight in the role it was designed to do and it's fighting against one that is poorly optimized for the task that it's being given uh, a russian military built for a different very different type of war trying to fight a war in this way which is why we're seeing i think now we'll see more of the russians drifting back towards existing doctrine the sort of stuff that we saw in syria i hope we don't see it but we might and as i said before this is unforgivable from a, a really cold strategic perspective for Russia because Russia got to choose this war. It got to initiate it on its terms. It presumably knew it was coming. Um, they could have spent the last 10 years preparing for it and we're not seeing any evidence that they did. So what am I seeing? Um, I'm seeing the myth of that Russia is just doing more with less partly busted. It looks like um, in order to be able to afford their nuclear weapons, their navy, their prestige uh, projects, um, all of their platforms on a budget of 60 odd billion US dollars per year, they've cut corners. It looks like they've cut corners everywhere and it's on the small stuff, but important stuff. Um, tanks and areas without navigation devices. We're not seeing much evidence of night capability or optics on Russian weapons. Like uh, Russian offensives tend to pause at night because the average infantryman in the average unit doesn't seem to have night fighting capability. Um, the Russian Air Force seems absent. And one of the best theories that is out there is because they don't have the uh, uh, supply of precision guided munitions necessary in order to carry out the conflict. They don't have enough They've invented cruise missiles, they've invented PGMs, but they don't have the inventory necessary to support operations. Um, people are observing and, and looking at vehicles and saying that they look like they haven't been given preventative maintenance. They look like they're using, in some cases, knockoff tires rather than properly specced ones. There's evidence everywhere of a lack of preventative maintenance. There's issues of tremendous readiness issues everywhere. Spending priorities have evidently not matched strategic operational and tactical needs. What they have spent on is not what they need to win this conflict the way that they plan to win it. And as a result, ordinary Russian troops are paying the price for vanity projects, corruption and poor support for the, uh, and a poor support spine for the military goals they've been asked to achieve. The Russian units are all teeth, they're all fires and they're no comms, they're no navigation, they're no coordination, they're no training, they're no readiness, they're no maintenance, they're no logistics. Um, they're all teeth and nothing else. And that's a problem for them. I'm sure the Ukrainians are very grateful that they have made that error. Um, but if we're going to take a learning experience out of these first couple of days, one of the initial things I note is this seems to be the problem, that there's a lot of cost cutting, that there's a lot of corruption, there's a lot of issues. And as a result, military performance is suffering. So is the Russian military shit? Because this is the hot, hot take that is increasingly appearing in all the commentary communities read it. There are now, even in defense journals, we've got articles popping up saying, hey, the Russian military is a paper tiger. Um, I don't think we have enough evidence to say that yet. We do have enough evidence to say that at the very least they effed up their priorities if they knew this conflict was coming. Um, before this conflict started, and I'll admit, I was and everyone I know was in the camp of they will not invade um, because, you know, um, we look for signals in their spending priorities in terms of what we think they're going to try and achieve. Their spending priorities to me, and this is just me, suggested that they wanted to be able to do global force projection to smaller conflicts. They wanted to be able to do this serious stuff. They wanted to be able to send small forces overseas, intervene in order to prop up global influence. They wanted to maintain prestige through their military. Uh, Russia has a weak economy. Russia has a declining population. Uh, Russia has deep domestic issues in its political system, in its social systems, but they have a strong military, they have a large nuclear force, and that maintains their international relevance and prestige. Nuclear deterrence was obviously one of their goals, although they way overspend on it. Um, they wanted to maintain their old cutting edge industrial capabilities, possibly for export purposes. Uh, there are a lot of potential markets out there for Russian hardware if it's peer or near peer with Western capabilities, but is either cheaper or you can be bought with fewer strings attached than, for example, when you buy advanced equipment from the United States or from Germany, it tends to come with a lot of strings. And they wanted large conventional capabilities at home, largely for domestic suppression. Um, and even those large legacy 
military capabilities they kept on hand, in a conventional campaign defending the homeland would be in a better shape because they're based at their supply bases. So you don't need a long logistics chain. You don't have motivation problems with conscripts if you're being invaded because like, I'm pretty sure it's not a controversial statement to say that while a Russian conscript invading Ukraine might not be particularly motivated, if it was Russia being invaded, you would not be seeing these boys throw their hands up quite so easily. History suggests very much otherwise. None of those priorities that were suggested by their spending align with what the Russian military has been asked to do in Ukraine. There is a serious investment capability gap, um, and that gap should have 100% been known to the political and military leadership. Now, whether there is a yes man problem wherein those at the top are being given inaccurate uh, understanding of what the capabilities on the ground are, or they're just dumb, and there's other explanations too, but either way, they should have known, they should have understood. Most Russian investment for the last 20 years is borderline useless to what they asked the military to do in Ukraine, which was quickly affect the takeover of a nation within 42 to 70, 48 to 72 hours um, and install a new puppet government in order to basically unify what they would call um, the, the little Russians and the greater Russians. So, uh, they want Belarusia, uh, Ukraine, and Russia all united. We, we understand that. That's been leaked from some of the articles, et cetera. Like, that's not controversial. We know Putin wants that. Um, so I would not have predicted this invasion based on their investment priorities because I would have assumed that they would invest in the capabilities they needed for this sort of conflict. Um, this conflict is also probably proof that they do need to re revisit the all fire, no support approach in designing their combat unit, but it's hard to judge based on seven days of cluster. You know, um, we need more evidence to understand, but generally the fact that Russian uh, BTGs are heavy on fire elements and short on support elements relative to Western units, suggesting maybe there's a reason, it's not just Western units are soft and require their hot meals every night from their canteen. Maybe there's a real logistics reason that uh, Western militaries weight more heavily towards support elements. So how could they have done better? Um, well, if they were listening to one bloke in Australia, and I'm glad because they don't have time to fix it now, um, let's say it's 2014, you knew this was coming, uh, what do you do other than not invade because invading is a dumb shit decision? Um, first, you have to create investment space. Uh, let's assume the Russians can't just massively increase the military budget. Um, they're already straining to do it as it is. Um, you need to buy space in the budget. So what would you do? Okay, so our goal is to be able to take over Ukraine quickly in a quick clean op. Uh, so we need, to get, we need extra money. Uh, a lot of legacy hardware has to go. So I would scrap thousands upon thousands upon thousands of tanks and AFEs. If it's too old and we can't afford to modernize it, it goes. Um, a lot of the Air Force goes. Uh, let's sign a new strategic arm limitation treaty with the West. It makes it look like we're being good global citizens, but mostly it's there so we can reduce the upkeep cost of our nuclear arsenal. Um, China doesn't feel the need to maintain 6,000 nukes, and yet it's perfectly safe because no Western leader is going to push an issue to the point that they initiate a nuclear war. And America doesn't care if it loses its 15 largest cities or its 2,000 largest cities. 15 cities is still too high, high a price to pay for just about anything. So get rid of most of the nukes. Um, stop pretending you're the United States Navy. You can't afford to be the United States Navy and you have no strategic need to be the US Navy. Um, the big vanity project ships like the Kirov class, I'm sorry, everyone loves them, but they're the Russians, Iowa's class battleships. People hanker to bring them back for prestige reasons. And I'm not saying the ships can't do a mission. I'm just saying they're bloody expensive and the mission they do is not worth the cost. Um, a lot of the Russian surface elements got to go. You can keep the submarines if you feel they need to, but the Navy's not helping you for the most part. Tone it down. Uh, you shrink the overall manpower footprint of the force considerably. Uh, a lot of the National Guard can go. The, a lot of the internal troops can go. Some of the railway troops can go. Um, you need to get smaller and more lethal. Uh, the aerospace and rocket forces have to shrink like a lot. Uh, massively reduce the number of airframes, trim the officer corps, and you exercise discipline in the development of new systems. Uh, if you can sell it reliably overseas and make money on it, it stays in. So things like the Su-57 probably stay. Stupid doomsday weapons that you will never use and no one will buy and you'll never export are out. I'm sorry, the underwater doomsday weapons that they probably made up anyway, if they exist, they're out. Um, that saves you a shit ton of money. 
then you resolve capability gaps. Uh, hardware modernization, don't forget the basics, get everyone goggles, get everyone ballistic vests, uh, invest in preventative maintenance, logistics, training, personnel retention, increase the, the pay of your troops so you can actually attract enough contractors and they stay on board and you get people with a good enough educational background and enough motivation in order to do it. Teach people to do their jobs, give the Air Force enough flying hours to actually practice running seed and give them the munitions to do it, practice doing CAS and give them the munitions to do it. Um, increase the quality of life for your troops so they're not um, just utterly demotivated. Um, you probably also have to deal with endemic corruption. That's beyond the scope of what I know about. I don't know how to fix corruption in the Russian military. Um, it's a problem. It's got to be solved. Um, I'm going to add a disclaimer at the bottom here, though. I am from the West, so my first inclination is to westernize the Russian forces because that's what I know. And clearly, if we didn't think it was the right thing, we wouldn't be doing it. Um, but I basically westernized the Russian military, <laughs> um, essentially, paring it down to the capabilities that they need in order to accomplish their goal. Um, that said, I think it was a dumb goal. And if I was, if you were in the charge of the Russian Federation, you were arguing what capabilities they should have, I'd give them a very different mission profile because I'm not insane. What about the West? What does the West do now? Um, continuing with the hot takes. Um, I think the West needs to decide if you're trying to help the Ukrainians win, Ukrainians win this, or are you just trying to make life hard for the Russians? Um, in the first part of the, after the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, I saw an interview with one of the guys, one of the CIA guys who was involved with this, and he said, and he was quite honest about the fact that for the first few years, they were just trying to make the Russians bleed. They were just sending in small quantities of weapons to try and increase the cost of occupying it. And then towards the end, Reagan comes in, and the strategy instead becomes flood Afghanistan with support in order to actually beat the Russians. Um, and we're seeing some signs that, maybe NATO is serious about helping the Ukrainians win this. The initial munitions response uh, that's being provided is promising, particularly from the Euros, not from the Americans, but particularly from the Europeans so far. Um, we're now in the territory of tens of thousands of ATGMs, uh, man pads, um, many tens of thousands of small arms, millions of rounds of ammunition, um, artillery pieces. I think the Czech sent 4,000 mortars. Like, there's a lot of equipment flowing in. And what we're seeing from this conflict is a relatively cheap investment in uh, javelins or end laws or all the other weapon systems that are coming in can be very effective, even in the hands of relatively unskilled operators. Like a territorial defense fighter with a little bit of training and an end law can absolutely bust up a tank crew. And they are busting up tank crews. And the javelins are performing tremendously. Some of this might be propaganda, some of this is fog of war, but certainly the indication is it's working. Um, I would add that temporary reductions in NATO conventional capabilities, to me, are probably 100% acceptable. Like, you're not going to go fight the Russians conventionally. So if you have to empty some Bundeswehr storehouses of weapons, if you have to leave your own units without munitions temporarily in order to send them to Ukraine, do it. Because you're not going to use your troops, whereas uh, the weapons that you're sending to Ukraine will be used. And then you want to make the calculus clear to the other side very, very quickly. You want to make it clear to the Russians they won't win and you want to do it as fast as possible. Um, I would suggest doing things like underwriting the Ukrainian budget if you have to. The West is entirely capable of underwriting the entire Ukrainian defense budget if it needs to. Ukraine doesn't need any money. Like It is relatively cheap by Western standards to pay for the entire cost of this thing. Uh, you go through all the Eastern European states, you empty the warehouses of every Warsaw Pact leftover they can find. Germany did this the other day when it went and found a whole bunch of Strellas, I think 2,700 of them, and said, hey, these are going to Ukraine. Um, my family are Croatian, and Croatia's got some old Yugo stocks that are going. The Czechs have got a whole bunch of old Yugo stocks going. Um, not old Yugo, old uh, Warsaw Pact stocks that are going. Um, so there's a lot of gear that you can shovel across the border as well as, you know, end laws, javelins and the various things that Spain and others are providing. Um, Russia, uh, another strategic concept is you want to make sure that you, to an extent, show there are consequences for another side breaking a rule. So Russian volunteers in inverted commas have been very active throughout the conflict. So Western inverted commas volunteers should be active in return. Um, we're already seeing the International Legion being formed. Um, but, you know, perhaps you could have some Western military troops go on vacation, quote unquote, um, in order to help at least handle training, probably on the Polish side of the border, in order to prepare Ukrainian troops before they head back over and, and fight. 
Uh, intelligence information warfare is obvious. Uh, the Ukrainians have probably already outsourced most of this to the West. Um, and I'll say that this from a investment perspective, which sounds very cold, but it's also the most humanitarian in a sense. Um, you want to build up capabilities as quickly as possible and make it clear quickly as possible to the other side that they can't win because the sooner this thing ends, the less damage there is to civilian infrastructure. Dragging it out um, is unnecessarily painful for everyone involved. Uh, too many Russian conscripts will die, too many Ukrainians defending their homes will die, civilian infrastructure will suffer. It's, it's, it's sad, it's horrible. So you want to end this thing as fast as possible. There's two ways you end it. Either Ukraine wins or Russia wins. Um, ceasefires with favoring one or the other are obviously species of that. Um, so unless you're willing to, if you're not willing to capitulate, then you need to be in it to win it and you need to be in it to win it as fast as possible, which is why countries as far as field as Australia are poning up tens of millions of dollars already in military aid to try and signal that they're serious about this thing. It's why the sanctions were so heavy straight away. Um, Side note, because building up capabilities quickly is, is important, uh, can the A-10 crowd in Congress be quiet, please? We are not sending A-10s to Ukraine to train and teaching Ukrainians how to fly them. Like, it's just not happening. Please be quiet. Um, a note here, Russia has the capability to escalate. So Russia, for example, could call its reserves. Russia has a large reservist force. They could mobilize. Ukraine has mobilized. Russia hasn't. Russia's just using active duty. There's not that many Russians invading Ukraine in the grand scheme of things. It's like 200,000 troops concentrated on the border. Um, not, and most of them have crossed, but that's still a relatively small force compared to the sort of manpower that Ukraine's trying to call up. Um, Russia could escalate, but you need to convince them that it's not worth it. And I don't, I'm not sure as an observer how the domestic situation in Russia would handle them, for example, calling up all their reservists. Um, I'd also encourage people just to be responsible, stop talking about World War III, Stop trying to make this World War III um, and stop describing Ukraine's inevitable defeat. Like, I actually think a lot of Western observers have been very unhelpful in saying, oh, you know, we think Ukraine will eventually lose. Screw that. Um, like, even if you believe that was true, there is zero advantage of putting that into the public domain. Um, I know there's a number of commentators who no longer believe Ukraine will lose because they've proven their willingness to fight. That matters. Um, and from a mathematical perspective, from an economic perspective, um, there's no reason to believe that this can't be turned one way or the other. And then finally, we should obviously take this as a signal to look at our own defense spending and industry plans, see if we've got our own white elephants. Are we falling into the same trap? Are any of us falling into the same trap as the Russians? You could be running a business in a completely non-military field and you can run into the same trap. Do you have prestige projects? Um, are you doing things you don't need to do? Are you neglecting your core business, your core capability in pursuit of some white elephant? Uh, and if you are, you need to trim that and get back to doing what you need to do in order to accomplish your goal, whatever that might be. So what's my summary um, for this bizarre video by someone who doesn't like to talk about their day job and instead likes to talk about video games? Um, militaries are built by long-term investments and capabilities. Despite spending vastly more than Ukraine, Russia's spending priorities have largely centered on capabilities that are not useful for the fight in Ukraine. Most of what they have spent is not useful for what they are trying to do. By contrast, what the Ukrainians have spent and also what they've received in aid has focused squarely on high return capabilities like infantry based, like light infantry, anti-armor capabilities, ATGMs, man pads, air defense. Um, high return capabilities for exactly this kind of scenario. Even the, the TB2 drones uh, from Turkey, low cost but high return capability for the war they're fighting. Um, Russia built the wrong military for the job. It doesn't mean they can't or won't win necessarily. They, they, they may well, um, but I don't think they have to. And certainly uh, it means that they could have invested much more wisely if they knew this was gonna be their goal. Western financial and military industrial resources are such that if the will is there, Russian victory can be severely complicated or even averted. Um, the West, Germany just announced a $100 billion stimulus to its defense budget. If the West wanted, the West could provide so much military aid to Ukraine that it would exceed the Russian military budget relatively easily. Um, it's possible. You can turn this into the mother of all proxy wars if you want to. Want to. I'm not advocating anything. I'm just pointing out that from an economic perspective, you can. Uh, Western military industrial complex go burr, basically. Um, 
It is, however, important not to fall into the trap of thinking this makes Russia a paper tiger in all capability um, areas. Their submarines seem to be good. Their nukes seem to be good. They have some advanced technological capabilities. They're just hollowed out, it seems, by all the corners they've cut all over the place, which is why this thing has been one giant train wreck from day one to day seven. Um, it's also not important not to fall into the trap of chauvinism and be blind to the issues and flaws in Western militaries. Uh, we have waste. We have goal spending mismatches. We have problems too. And if anything, a lesson we should take out of this is that it's really bloody important to hunt those down and be disciplined about it. To make sure that you're checking their expenditure, you're checking your priorities, you're questioning every platform, every system, uh, every dollar that goes into the military or is taken out to make sure that you're getting bang for your buck and developing capabilities that don't make people feel warm and fuzzy or look really good on YouTube videos, but rather that succeed in the objectives that your nation requires the military to undertake. And the final point is that I should go back to discussing video games. Um, I'm just going to leave my best wishes for all the people who are caught up in this. Um, it is, as I said, a, a tragedy. As a historian, it's a tragedy. As a human being, it is a tragedy. Um, and I wish uh, health and good luck to all involved. Um, yes, it's good to take technical lessons uh, in our fields out from this. It's good to observe and learn lessons um, so that we can take something away from that in our nations uh, and be better and stronger for it. Um, but no one should forget uh, that we're talking about a real conflict with real people. Uh, it's not just memes, it's real. So I wish the best to all involved. Good luck to you all.